And it really, it is hard to believe that it is 2023. I mean, you really, I think as you get older, it, it happens more, but the years go, they go when you're young, and then when you get older, they're wham, wham, they start flying by. And I, I sometimes have to pause and ask myself, where did 2022 go? And, and for some of you, 2022 was an amazing year. Some of you got married. <laughs> some of you, Bryce over here, some of you bought a new car. You got a new house, you got a new job. It was an amazing year. You had some amazing things happen to you that as you kind of look back at 2022, it honestly brings a smile to your face. You just think, wow, that was just an incredible year. And I think even being, coming out of post-COVID, it, it kind of seemed like it was a little bit brighter. But for others that are here today, you're ready to put 2022 in the rearview mirror. You, you just had some things that, that were incredibly challenging. It was a, it was a difficult year for you. Uh, but I think no matter how you actually feel about 2022, all of us have had some really good things happen in our life. And we, we really have. And, and although a lot of times it gets buried under the difficulties and the challenges that we actually walked through or that we faced, if you look back at the past year, and here's the key, if you look back with an attitude of gratitude... Yeah. You might be surprised as you kind of remember how amazing 2022 actually was. God, I'm thankful that I got a raise. God, I'm thankful that I got married. God, I'm, I'm thankful, Lord God, that you brought some amazing friends into my life. God, I'm thank you that you healed me this year, that you provided for me supernaturally. God, that you did extraordinary things in my life. God, thank you, thank you, thank you. And, and I think you know this, but I think we all need to be reminded of it from time to time is that you are in charge of your attitude. Just so you know that society's not, your spouse isn't, your friends aren't, you are in charge of your attitude. And this is the cool part. You actually get to decide what kind of attitude you're going to have. You do. And man, when you start really understanding that, because some people don't think they do. Some, some people think, well, I'd have a good attitude if I wasn't married to so-and-so. Or I'd have a good attitude if I just had a little bit better job. I'd have a good attitude. And listen, you're letting people have power in your life that they're not supposed to have in your life. You are responsible for you. And, and here's the great thing about it. I love it because sometimes I, I got to be honest as a pastor with you today. And I always love it when people say, can I be honest with you? I thought, I thought you'd been being honest with me as we're talking. But, but as a pastor, my attitude is not always where it should be. And, and, I, and I get this. Stinky attitude. In fact, I was having a friend with a pastor friend of mine, Garvin, this week, and he was reminding me of something they always says. He kind of reminds people every once in a while, go, you smell that? And I'll go, like, what? And he go, it's your attitude, man. It stinks. <laughs> Sorry, Garvin, for throwing you under the bus there. But sometimes we do. We get stinky attitude. And you know what? When we have a bad attitude, you know who it hurts the most is us. We're depressed. We're, we're down. Life stinks. Or if you want to be honest, life sucks. I mean, that's how you feel a lot of times when you're, you're getting yourself down. And, and here's what I want to encourage all of us. Don't leave the past of 2022. Um, make sure you, like, let me say this again. Leave the past of 2022 in the past. Because if you don't, it's not part of your past. It's a part of your present reality. In fact, that's why a lot of people, you still deal with things that happened 10 years ago, 15 years ago, because you keep dragging past issues into your present life, and you're wondering why they're so heavy. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Y'all knew that was coming, right? And, and I do believe that I think most of us try to have an attitude of gratitude most of the time. I mean, I think when we really are reminded about it, we think about it, but sometimes when, when life throws us a curve or something challenging is happening in our life... Something comes up that we didn't expect, whether it's a relationship issue. I always say about 98% of our problems are in relationship issues. They are relationship issue, a financial issue, a health issue, a career issue, whatever it might be. If we're not careful, we can begin to lose an attitude of gratitude and we can forget all of the things that we actually have to be thankful for. We do, we just forget it like that. Whereas things that are frustrating to us they pop up at the forefront of our mind and we can rattle them off really quick and we can remember those things, but we have a hard time remembering all of the good things that God's done. And I believe that every one of us likes to be around people who are thankful. We do. We like to be around people who are thankful. We like to be around people who have a positive 
attitude. We, we're not sure why all the time, but we just enjoy being around them. In, in fact, when, when, we, when I get around people who are thankful, I actually sometimes want to hire them. It's one of the reasons, honestly, why I hired Jonathan and Candace. They're some of the most thankful people I know. They're thankful that they get to serve in children's ministry. Some of you, your mind just went, Poof. what? First of all, they recognize they're hardwired. So just so you know, we won't be asking you on your way out. You want to be in children's ministry? Be in children's ministry? Okay, we won't do that. They're hardwired to do it, but they're thankful that they get to do it. So I want to hire people or at the, at the, at the best, I want them to become my friend. I like hanging around with people that are thankful because we are drawn to people who have an attitude of gratitude. In in our culture, in the world in which you and I live in, that is actually not the norm. It it isn't. It is easy for us to focus on not being thankful or or to forget to be thankful, to to get negative, to to go in a wrong direction. And, And all of a sudden we find ourselves saying things that are negative. We start doing, having these behaviors that are because we're feeling these negative vibes or we start posting things that are negative on Facebook. Listen, but Listen, if you want to stand out in the crowd, if you want to be a success, if you want people to like you, if you want a boss to hire you, people will do that with people who have an attitude of gratitude. We just want to be around those people. In fact, it's something that I am constantly having to work on myself because it's easy for me to sometimes have to see how things can get better. In fact, it's honestly part of the way that I'm wired. I've got this gift of wonder. Um, If you're familiar with this thing called working genius, where I'm always thinking it literally drives my wife nuts. In in fact, when we bought our house, and and if you you all knew our house from before, it was kind of closed in, and and I began to visually see it being open and all these different things. And my wife said, are you ever going to be happy? And I said, I am happy. I just see how things could be better. But if I'm not careful, I can get unthankful. And rather than noticing all of the amazing things that are happening around me, I'll talk about the one thing that we missed instead of the 10 things that we got right. So I've got to constantly be adjusting my life. And I believe this is one of those qualities. And it's one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about it today at the beginning of 2023. I think it's one of those qualities that that will literally change your life in 2023 if you'll have it if you'll develop an attitude of gratitude. In fact, I'm gonna close off the message by saying this to you, but I wanna encourage this to be your mantra. Am I having an attitude of gratitude right now? And if you wanna really get good at this, invite somebody into your life to let them ask you the question. Are you having an attitude of gratitude right now? It really will change your life. In fact, Paul writing to the church at Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 18 says this, that we are to give thanks in all circumstances. Now notice it's not we are to give thanks for all circumstances. All right, so when something goes bad, go, okay, God, thank you that I've got pneumonia. You know, you don't have to do that. But in the midst of pneumonia, God, I'm giving thanks in all circumstances. Watch this, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So what I give thanks for is, God, I have pneumonia, but God, I thank you that you are my healer. You don't say, I've got a financial setback. God, thank you that I just had this bill come up that I wasn't expecting, $12,000. Oh, thank you, Jesus. No, but God, thank you that you are my provider. So I'm not giving thanks for the circumstances. I'm giving thanks in all circumstances. So I want to look at a story in Luke chapter 7. If you've got your Bibles, you're going to want to flip over there. And, And hopefully it'll help us recognize today that it's only the love and the goodness of God that can create in us a thankful heart. It's only the revelation. Again, if you see God as a God that's angry with you, he's a lawgiver, he's all about the rules, you are, gonna have, you are gonna struggle having a thankful heart. But when you begin to recognize how perfectly God loves you, you'll be amazed at how a thankful heart will begin to bubble up on the inside of you. And listen, who doesn't wanna have a thankful heart? Who doesn't want to walk around and just be grateful for all the things that are going on around you, just having this grateful heart? So as we look at this story in Luke chapter 7, I'm I'm hoping that we can discover the two greatest obstacles for you and I actually being grateful. Because there's two of, I believe, are the greatest obstacles for you and I being thankful. So Luke chapter 7, verse 36 says this. When one of the Pharisees, by the way, this is a guy named Simon, we're going to find out here in a few verses, invited Jesus to have dinner with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and he reclined 
at the table. Now, this is interesting because if you have read your Bible, you know that the Pharisees were the ones that were continually opposing Jesus. They were the ones trying to trick him. They were the ones trying to figure out to, to trip him up so people wouldn't be following after him. And so this, this Pharisee invites Jesus over to his house and Jesus accepts his invitation. I don't know for sure, but he may have been surprised that Jesus said yes. So the story goes on in verse 37, and it says, a woman in that town who lived a sinful life. Now, just so you know, she's probably a prostitute. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. Now, we don't really know much about this woman, but she obviously walks in on the middle of a meal, apparently so moved by Jesus and grateful for what he's done. I don't know if this was the woman who had gotten caught in adultery, and now she's so grateful, but somehow Jesus had impacted her life. So she comes in and she falls to her knees, and she takes the thing that is most valuable to her. She takes the thing that probably was part of her livelihood, the perfume, because as a prostitute, she needed to smell good. She needed to smell good for her business. So she is literally taking her livelihood and she is pouring it on Jesus. Then she is taking her hair and wiping the feet of Jesus with her tears. And sometimes we, we can read the Bible and we look at that and we say, oh, what a beautiful expression of worship. I mean, and, and, it, and it really is, but Jesus would have been wearing open-toed sandals. His feet would have been dirty. His feet would have been dusty. And again, you read something and it sounds awesome, but this is an incredibly gritty scene of what this woman is doing. And at first it appears that Jesus doesn't even notice really what's going on. But the Pharisee does. In fact, look at the next verse. He says this, Then when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, now notice we already recognize there's some doubt in Simon's heart. If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of a woman she is, that she is a sinner. But I want you to know that J Jesus did notice her and Jesus did know her and Jesus knew what was going on. In fact, he goes on talking to Simon in the next verse. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Then Jesus goes on to tell Simon a parable. And just for those of you that remember, parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Jesus is trying to illustrate something about the goodness of God in this point. Verse 41, it says, two people owed money to a certain money lender who owed, one owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Now, just so you know, a denarii was roughly a day's wage. So what that basically meant is that one person owed him a year and a half's wage. Think about it. You make $20,000 a year. You owe him $30,000. The other one owed him three months wage. Still a lot of money, right? Neither of them had money to pay him back. So he forgave the debts of both. Jesus is still talking. Now, which of them he's asking, can you go back to that? Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven and you have judged correctly, Jesus said. Now listen, Jesus said something next that doesn't really translate well in the culture that we live in today because there's something in that culture that was incredibly important to people when they hosted people and had people in their home, all right? So here's what he said. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I have entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Again, we need some cultural context again to understand this because hosting in Jesus' day was an art form. Uh, it was an honor to actually have someone into your home. There was a lot of preparation that they would do, a lot of things that they would take place, a lot of planning of the meal, planning for the arrival of the guests, planning every aspect of the event. Yeah. And when someone would arrive at your house, you would give them water 
so that they could wash their feet. You would give them oil so that they could anoint their head. You would greet them with a kiss because you were welcoming them into your house. But nowadays, we don't think like that. When, when we have people over, sometimes we're sitting on the couch and say, hey, drinks are in the fridge, <laughs> right? So as a general rule, we don't actually understand hosting like they did then. But it's incredibly crucial to the story because here's why. Whereas Simon should have given Jesus water for his feet, this woman was was washing Jesus' feet with her tears and with her hair. Whereas Simon should have given Jesus oil to anoint his head, this woman used expensive perfume that she was pouring on his feet. Simon should have greeted Jesus with a kiss, but this woman was continually kissing his feet. This woman is oblivious, obviously grateful, sorry, this woman is obviously grateful for what Jesus had done. And so she expressed it by doing, by the things that she was doing. Simon did nothing. Simon didn't do anything, probably because he thought Jesus was a fraud. In fact, he probably invited him over to his house so that he could actually investigate him and find out really where this fraud had come from. And as a religious leader, he had lived his entire life and devoted his life looking for the Messiah. And catch this. And now the Messiah is reclining at his table. Okay, okay, y'all tracking with me? He's been looking for the Messiah. Now the Messiah is sitting at his table. And he missed the opportunity to see Jesus as the Messiah and to be grateful. He missed the opportunity. And so in this, we see the first obstacle that we have towards having a grateful heart towards Jesus or having a grateful heart in general. And it's this, we become too familiar. Familiarity. It's when we begin to take the extraordinary things and begin to see them as ordinary. So listen, God saved us from the pit. Let me say that again. God saved us from hell. God saved us from destruction. God saved us from a life that was empty and filled with hopelessness. God saved us. And, and we're, when that happens and we, we get newly saved, it's one of the amazing things about being around newly saved people is they are so excited. They can't wait to get to church on Sunday. They, they can't wait to hear about God's goodness, about God's grace, about what God has done and all of the amazing things that God has actually already provided for them. They're so excited, they actually get into a small group. They get a group of friends around them that begin to love on them and pour into them. And then they begin serving others. Why? Because they're just so thankful. They're, they're just so thankful that, man, they get to do this. And, and they're like the children of Israel who crossed through the Red Sea. And when they got to the other side, they were rejoicing and dancing and just celebrating. However, then they found themselves on the backside of the desert. They found themselves in a dry place and they, on their journey with God, and they became ungrateful. And this is what happens to us if we're not careful. We are on a journey into our journey, months, sometimes years, and, and then we get into a dry place. We get into a place where we don't emotionally feel what we used to feel. And suddenly the extraordinary things that God did for us, that he saved us, that he healed us, that he delivered us, puts, he put us in a family. He put us in a church family, surrounded us with people that can encourage us and speak life into us. It becomes f- uh, familiar and we become ungrateful for it. And, and then it becomes, after a while in the dry place is, so what have you done for me lately? Right? It's, it's what? You, you want me to show up on Sundays and you want me to serve? What? You, you want me to become a part of the process that helps people experience the love and hope of Jesus Christ that's experienced every Sunday? Listen, men, you're asking way too much. You are just legalistic. You think I've got to be there all the time and serve all the time. Listen, I'm only going to be able to make it about once a month and I can only, I'm only going to be able to serve when I feel like it. And what happens basically is we've invited Jesus into our situation or over to our house to use this analogy. And we're sitting on the couch and we're telling Jesus, hey, drinks are in the fridge, help yourself. And we think, I wouldn't do that for Jesus. I wouldn't do that to Jesus. 
But if you remember that at the end of the age, when Jesus separates the goats from the sheep, he says that when you've done it, unto the least of these. What we do for others is what we're doing for Jesus. So you and I are constantly faced with the choice in this story. We either get to be Simon or we get to be the woman that's in the story. And it's our actions, not, not the intents in our heart. It's actually our actions that reveal the thankfulness, the gratefulness that's actually in our heart. And it's interesting how it begins to show up in the way that we treat other people. It, it really is. We, we pray for a spouse. We, we pray for kids. We, we, we pray for friends. And then we walk the journey with them. And if we're not careful, we can let that become familiar. Where we become very familiar with our spouse. We become very familiar with our kids, very familiar with our friends. And suddenly everything they do is wrong. Or everything they do gets on our nerves. And we let the extraordinary, because I don't know about you, but my wife is extraordinary. My kids are extraordinary. My friends are extraordinary. We let the extraordinary become ordinary. Why? Because simply because we become familiar. We've let a familiarity set in. Have you ever noticed how easy it is for your prayer request to turn into a praise report and then turn into a prayer request again? The thing that you prayed for that you can't believe that God did for you now is driving you nuts? God, I want to be married. Oh, God, thank you for my spouse. Oh, God, they're driving me nuts. Could you fix them? God, I need kids. God, I need kids. Oh, thank you for my kids. Oh, what are, how long are these kids going to live in this house? Oh, God, I need friends. Please give me some friends. Oh, thank you, God, for the friends. And I cannot believe my friends would think like that. Our prayer request turns into a praise report and then turns into a prayer request again. And often in our lives, we forget. The Word of God says that we become forgetful hearers. It's one of the reasons why we want you to read through the Bible this year so you can understand, if nothing else, just how amazing the new covenant is compared to the old covenant. Man, when you read the old covenant, like, man, I don't know if I could have done that. You read the new covenant going like, oh, Jesus already did this. Listen, we, we, we forget what Jesus did for us. And instead of focusing on becoming more like Jesus, we focus on becoming more like us. Which leads me to the second point of why we are challenged sometimes having a grateful heart. And it's the focus on self. Or being self-focused, self-absorbed. The word of God says that in the last days, people will be lovers of themselves. That's not, you know, it's not that kind of a thing. It's just everything's about me. Life's about me. Make it about me, 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 me. And, and with Simon, the self-centeredness was self-righteousness. He, he believed that his righteousness was based on how well he had lived his life rather than understanding that Jesus was ushering in a new covenant, that it was going to be all about the debt that Jesus actually forgave every one of us, that we've already been forgiven. The, the only reason why people go to hell is they simply don't receive the forgiveness that God has already provided for them. See, that's why 2 Corinthians 5 says this, God made him, talking about Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. There was a great exchange that took place that Jesus took our sin and gave us his righteousness. And, and I say this all the time, but listen, if you're a child of God, you can't be any more righteous than you are now. In God's eyes, you are completely righteous. Your behavior can get more righteous. And when we begin to understand who we are, our behavior will get more righteous. But Simon, he, he just didn't realize that Jesus, all that Jesus was going to do for him. He, he didn't recognize that Jesus was going to do for him what he could not do for himself. That's why he looked down upon this woman and said, she's such a great sinner. And he looked down upon Jesus for allowing this woman to touch him. Because what this woman understood that Simon didn't was her need for a savior. This woman understood it. She was grateful that Jesus loved her. The word of God says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Going on in the story, verse 47, Luke 7. Therefore, Jesus talking still, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. 
as her great love has shown, for whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. And, and, and the truth is, is that none of us have received just a little bit of forgiveness. In fact, Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us have missed the mark. And, and like Simon, when we become ungrateful and we focus on ourselves, our tendency is to become very critical of the behaviors of others. Because there's always this comparison game going on and we give ourselves a pass because our behavior wasn't near as bad as their behavior, right? Because you can always find somebody that's a little bit worse than you. So we think we've been forgiven little. But the truth is that we have need of a savior to forgive us of our sins. Verse 48, then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. And the other guests began to say among themselves, who is this that even forgives sins? And Jesus said to this woman, and here's what I wanna close and catch this, your faith has saved you, go in peace. And, and what we see with this woman is that her faith actually had feet. Her faith had action. Her faith in Jesus caused her to do something to respond with a grateful heart that he had saved her. It, it caused her to respond. And guess what the, the word saved here in the Greek actually is? It's one of my favorite words, sozo. I, I love it because sozo means to save, meaning you're going to heaven, but it means so much more than that. It means to heal, to deliver, to make whole in every area and arena of your life. That's the salvation that Jesus actually died to provide you. It's not just about fire insurance. I'm thankful for fire insurance. I'm thankful that I get to go to heaven. But it's much more than that, that Jesus came that we might have life and have life more abundantly now, here and now. And, and, and I believe that sometimes when we allow the attitude of gratitude to become an attitude of ungratitude, we literally stop, start pinching off God's blessing. His blessing is still flowing towards us. He's still giving it away, but it pinches it off. We, we pinch off the process of salvation, that sozo process of salvation that brings healing and deliverance and wholeness into every area of our life. It's kind of what I was talking about over the last three weeks. We don't let the light of God's love shine into dark areas of our life. We get so used to it, we just live with it and say, this is the way it's supposed to be. So here, here, here's my challenge. Here's, here's the thing as we begin 2023. And man, I want to say, guys, thank you for being here. Thank you for watching online. And again, way to set your life in the proper direction. But in 2023, let's not become familiar with the things of God. And you know, this is especially true for those of us that have been followers of Jesus Christ for a long time. It's so easy for us to become familiar. Let's not become familiar. Let's not allow the extraordinary to become ordinary. You know, every week, almost every week, we have someone who gives their life or rededicates their life to Christ. That's amazing. Yes. We shouldn't be thinking, oh, I hope I can get out of here and beat everyone else out. We should be thinking, oh, thank you, God, one. Okay, oh, God, thank you, two. God, thank you, three. Thank you, four people giving their life to Christ today. Listen, and, and that's not even counting the people that walked through the doors that were giving up on their marriage. They were, they, were, they were depressed and dealing with some anxiety and one of you said something kind to them or you prayed with them and you said, listen, man, you could get through this and their whole direct direction of their life has changed. You've literally changed the trajectory of their life simply by praying for them. Let's, let's not, not become familiar with that stuff. Let's stay connected. Listen, stay apart. It's, it isn't about legalism, checking off the list. Okay, I came every Sunday. Listen, stay apart, stay connected. Walk out a saving faith. Walk out a saving faith that will bring wholeness, healing, deliverance into every area of your life. And let's not operate with a focus on self. I know people come from time to time and you know, hey, what are you doing for me at this church? And listen, we wanna do, we wanna minister to you. Especially if you've come in here and you've been beat up by life and you are literally on the proverbial table of, of the OR and you need some operation, you need some help, we wanna give you some intensive care. But I want you to know it is not our goal for you to remain on the bed of intensive care forever. We want to see you get well. We want to see you get whole. We want to see you get up and become the doctors, the nurses, the orderlies that are helping other people out. Because again, you've got a purpose and you've got a destiny. 
So let's not be self-focused. Let's not, let's not operate in self-righteousness. Especially for those of you that maybe you've been on the journey a little bit longer and there's some people coming behind you and they're struggling with some stuff that you struggled with a year ago or two years ago. Let's not be casting aspersions back at them or saying things to them that are gonna get them defeated, but remind them, hey, remind you, you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I've been there, I've dealt with alcoholism, I've dealt with drug addiction, I've dealt with pornography, I've dealt with a hateful attitude, I've dealt with a gossiping tongue. And we begin to help them. It's not operating self-righteousness where even though God has lavished his grace upon us, we look through the wrong filter. We look through a critical eye and we're judgmental towards others. Well, let's receive God's grace. The word of God says that we are to receive an abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. Why? So that we can have it for ourselves, yes, but also so that we can give that grace away to others. If you do this, I promise you 2023 is going to be an amazing year. It is going to be a breakout year. It is going to be an incredible year. You're going to see some dreams come to pass. You're going to see some things that you've been believing for for a long time. You're going to see some relationships in your life. You're going to see some things happen that you didn't think were going to happen simply because you decided to have an attitude of gratitude. And here's the thing, just like making a choice to come to church today, you have to make this choice every day. In fact, I would say you have to make it almost every moment. Because there is constantly going to be an, an attack of the enemy, a distraction, a dry place the enemy is going to try to bring into your life that's going to get you to try to become unthankful. But anytime you start feeling that attitude of ungratitude, just start asking yourself, okay, do I have an attitude of gratitude? Or as I said earlier, if you really want to get good at this, which Pam, I want to invite you to do this for me in 2023. Do you have an attitude of gratitude? I'm telling you, it, it will change and start fixing some things in your life that you'll never be the same. So I want to pray over us today. If you'd bow your head and close your eyes. I, I want to pray the, over the two obstacles that most people deal with. And maybe the first one is you become familiar with the things of God. Or maybe you become familiar with your family or your job or a, a variety of things, but you recognize, man, Richie, I, I don't really have an attitude of gratitude. I, I've not been really thankful and the word of God teaches us that we enter his gates with thanksgiving. We literally enter the presence of God with a thankful heart, with an attitude of gratitude. So maybe first of all, you've allowed some things to become familiar. Maybe the other thing is you go, man, I'm a little self-focused. The, the difficult thing about that is we typically don't realize when we're self-focused. And so I, I wanna pray over you today and I wanna, I wanna pray that God would speak to your heart so that you would know what it is, what, what's happening. Because again, every one of us are on a journey to continually have an attitude of gratitude, to refocus our lives, to make sure that we're walking in the fullness of life that God has for us. So Lord, I pray for every person that's here today. And Lord, I ask right now, Father, for your Holy Spirit to breathe fresh life into each and every one of us. God, I pray for people, especially that got their hearts wide open today. Lord, their arms are wide open, their minds wide open and are saying, God, come in. Show me. Walk through every area of my life. God, see if there's anything in me. See if there's any ungrateful area in me today. Because, Lord, I want to have an attitude of gratitude. Lord, I want to learn how to give thanks in all circumstances. God, I want to I be like that woman, Lord, that you're the focus of my life, that you're the thing that I'm intentional about. So, Lord, I pray today that you would speak to each and every one of our hearts for us to recognize where we're at, what's going on. God, that we can make every necessary adjustment to have the attitude of gratitude that you want us to have so that as we go into 2023, God, we'll be amazed at what you begin to do in our lives as you're working through us. So thank you. Thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you that you've saved us. Thank you that you've set us free. Thank you that you have provided healing for us and deliverance for us today. We love you, Lord, and thank you.